साइड में रखना अच्छा भी इधर रखना सारा बोलूँगी मैं बोलूँगी कि हमारे साथी हैं ये लेक्चर दे रहे हैं क्वेश्चन आंसर फिर मैं बोलूँगी वेलकमिंग एवरी वन देट वेलकमिंग द गेस्ट टेलिंग समथिंग अबाउट हिम देन आई टेल अबाउट द प्रोग्राम दैट वी हैव अ लेक्चर टू डे उसके बाद वी बिगिन विद वीडियो then then mm -hmm. then publication, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. Yes. 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 Which one? Mm -hmm. Abhi jo tha na? Mm -hmm. file nikalo mm -hmm. Yes. 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 निकाल तो दिया हमने लेकिन So one was of 30th March and another is of 31st. You have to, you have one only one for today, 31st. So we'll go only one. Yes, 31st. So look for the 30. Look for 30. 30 for. No, one is COVID-19. No. Sir, it's here. Which one? It was there. Up, a little up there. Here, India, S R H U, March 31st. मॉर्निंग में हो गया मॉर्निंग में हो गया अभी तो आई होप दैट वुड एवरीथिंग एंड देन देवर इज वन व्हिच जस्ट सेइंग मेबी एस एस आर यू हियर दिस वन ट्रांसलेट एस आर यू सी दिस इज मार्च ऑफ दिस वन ओके द शो व्हाट इज दिस दिस इज कोविड नाइनटीन या या नो नो इट्स इट्स कोविड नाइनटीन ओके सो या दिस इज दिस दिस वन ओके कॉलो जरा इसको एक मिनट यू पुट द स्क्रीन डाउन स्क्रीन डाउन नहीं चाहिए फॉर अ मिनट ओके सो शुरू है जस्ट अ मिनट लेट मी खोल दिखाओ जरा दिस द टॉक राइट या इट्स ओके या ओके देन द राइट राइट इसी को रखना है या या सो वी विल डू इट लेटर ऑन कम ना ओके आई लीव दिस वाज अ
sorry for the delay. A delightful af afternoon to you all. Honorable Vice Chancellor Swami Ram Himalayan University, Dr. Vijay Thasmana. Pro Vice Chancellor Swami Ram Himalayan University, Dr. Vijay Chahan. Registrar Swami Ram Himalayan University, Dr. Sushila Sharma. Eminent guests, members of boards of governor and board of management. Advisors to the university, Dr. Prakash Keshavya, Mr. H.P. Unyal, and Dr. C.S. Nautyal. Director, Strategic Planning and Research and Development, Dr. Dubal. Director, CRI, Dr. Saini. Director, Medical Services, Dr. Mushtaq. Professor Emeritus, Dr. Rakesh Sharma. Our distinguished guest, Dr. Aaron Chihanover. Principals and Vice Principals of all the constituent colleges officers of the universities and faculty members and dear students. On behalf of Swami Ram Himalayan University, I extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished guest, Nobel Laureate Dr. Aron Chah uh, Chahanove. <laughs> Dr. Aron is with us today as the first distinguished guest speaker under the Distinguished Lecture Series. He's an Israeli biochemist he investigates cellular mechanisms that mark proteins for degradation. His discovery that regulatory protein ubiquitin attaches to a target protein in order to control its degradation process made him world famous. In 2004, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry together with Avram Hershko and Irwin Rose for this discovery. The scientists have thus provided essential insights into disposal of defective or excess protein from cells. Today, we are all here for uh, Dr. Aaron's lecture on bioethics in medicines. And this, is we, uh, this will be followed by question answer session. But we'll begin with a short video today.
become a small family. The whole world is like a small family. But now we should learn how to live together with each other, how to behave with each other. You see. So it's love that will help actually. But a selfless person alone has capacity to love others. So selflessness is the foundation stone of entire life concept. I request Honorable Vice Chancellor, Pro Vice Chancellor, Registrar, Dr. Ron, Dr. Saini, Dr. Dobal, Dr. Prakash, and Dr. Rakesh to light the lamp. I now request Honorable Vice Chancellor to facilitate, to felicitate our eminent guest, Professor Aron, and present him with memento. Thank you, sir. I now invite Pro Vice Chancellor Dr. Johan to read the citation. A very good afternoon, everybody. The citation reads as follows Swami Rama Himalayan University is privileged to invite Professor Aaron Shanover to inaugurate the Distinguished Lecture Series of the University. Professor Aaron Shanover is a Distinguished Research Professor in the Faculty of Medicine at the Technion Israel Institute of Technology in Haifa, Israel. He received his doctorate in biochemistry in 1981 from the Technion Israel Institute of Technology. As a graduate student with Dr. Avram Harshako, 
Professor Chianover discovered the process responsible for ubiquitin mediated degradation of proteins. The ubiquitin protease pathways plays a critical role in the homeostasis of cells and is believed to be involved in the development and progression of cancer, muscular neurological disease, as well as immune and inflammatory responses. Professor Shianover received the Albert Lasker Award in the year 2000, the Israel Prize in Biology in 2003, and the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, which is shared with doctors Hershko and Rose in 2004 for his work on ubiquitination. He is a member of the Israel Academy of Sciences and Humanities and has also been honored with the coveted membership of the National Academies of Sciences and Medicine of the United States of America. Professor Shianover is a member of the Advisory Board of Patient Innovation, a nonprofit, international, multilingual, free venue for patients and caregivers of any disease to share their innovations. Swami Rama Himalayan University is honored to be graced with the presence of Professor Shianover and looks forward to a continued association with him in the service of humanity. Thank you. I request Honorable Vice Chancellor to honor him with the citation. Honorable Dr. Aaron, distinguished guests, officers of our university, faculty members, I extend a hearty welcome to all of you. Dr. Akesh Kumar, he has been associated with us for last, I think, seven, eight years, nine years. He is a bioscientist have done extensive research in the field of cancer and that's how I think there was a conference law almost 10 years back he visited us and then he got associated with our university and behind the scene he is not active member of our organization but from behind the scene he has been very helpful to us this idea of uh, distinguished lecture series was given to me by Dr. Rakesh during his last meeting and that's how this whole event is taking place today. Uh, he's well connected. He's our well-wisher, so I extend a hearty welcome to you, sir. And that's how Dr. Aaron is here today because Dr. Aaron is a very close friend of Dr. Rakesh. We decided that we will have this lecture series every year during our University Foundation Day. This time it is a little late, but we will call eminent scientists. We have to bring this university into global map. We cannot remain in Jolly Grant only. So that is the purpose of, uh, purpose of this <laughs> lecture series. Dr. Aaron, I extend a hearty welcome to you on behalf of the whole organization by Board of Governors, Board of Management, the Academic Council, the faculty of this university. Uh, a very eminent scientist, the last two days he is with us. Yesterday he had very good session with our undergraduate students, today with postgraduates and now this is the first lecture under the distinguished lecture series he is going to deliver. I extend a hearty welcome to you sir once again and I am sure all of you will uh, be benefited from his word of wisdom and after this we expect that some good questions from your side. We do want all of us to get inspiration from Dr. Aaron, his work, his zeal, his energy. I have been observing him for the last uh, 48, uh, 24, 24 hours, maybe 36 hours. The energy is in, his, in him, a remarkable energy. 
he yesterday he started his journey 6 o'clock in the morning from delhi and then he was jumping around meeting people He's excited yesterday we went to ganga aarti also he was excited there also so lot of things to learn from these souls these noble people who are doing tremendous job for our society for humanity so once again i extend a hearty welcome to you sir and i hope you all will enjoy this lecture thank you very much thank you sir i now invite professor ron to deliver his lecture on bioethics in medicine thank you very much for first inviting me here and two for a very warm welcome it was really unbelievable two rich days uh, yesterday on the way from uh, delhi to dehradun uh, we stopped uh, along the way to see what i knew about about you know how the indian people are collecting the dung in order to heat their homes then we went to see how they burned bodies of the dead which is makes a lot of sense you know and uh, you know it was two very rich days and uh, thank you very much for organizing it since my computer crashed i had to shorten my trip because tomorrow i was supposed to go to amritsar but that will happen next time i am extremely happy to open this uh, series of lectures of uh, distinguished scientist i don't regard myself as distinguished i think that the most uh, the benefit that we can gain from one another is mutual i am learning a lot about india about the culture about the people about medicine about higher education and you are learning about different culture that i am coming from i think that we are all human beings and we are all uh, uh, there to improve human life and to benefit from one another i don't think that anybody is above anybody i don't believe in that everybody contributes whatever they can and and this takes me to my talk now we are all in medicine i am myself uh, i'm not a practicing physician i used to be a surgeon uh, and medicine is all about patients and i never forgot the patients even that i left practical medicine Uh, almost uh, 50 years ago uh, and diseases are awful in the sense that they flip the lives of people upside down especially severe diseases you know you can imagine in israel i'm i'm the president of the israel cancer society which is a big society that provides a lot of help to patients we have many ngos in israel for each disease and cancer is a big one and i'm the president of the israel cancer society and In Israel there are about uh, 30,000 we are a small country of 8 and a half million people about 30,000 new cases of cancer every year. And every day about every day every day every day about 50 women coming to the clinic and they discover that they have breast cancer. And men are coming and discover that they have prostate cancer and brain cancer and pancreatic cancer and cholangiocarcinoma and hepatic cancer and all types of diseases and alzheimer disease and so on so you can imagine on a range of time let's say that it's monday evening and the patient knows that tomorrow he has an mri so everything is fine they look in the television they are a little bit concerned but they go to the mri and they get out of the mri with a death penalty they have a glioblastoma a tumor of the brain they have pancreatic cancer that cannot be even resected that it's all spread out which is most of the cases they have ovarian cancer you can think about less than 24 hours and their lives are turning upside down and not only their lives but the lives of their families excuse me for taking off this one though i'm very proud of it i'm going to to wear it proudly this my belonging to india my indian part um So the lives are yeah keep it for me <laughs> D- don't take it don't take it um the lives are, are are turning upside down and the lives of the family and the kids and what to do to go to the lawyer and the will and the property and the work and the employer everything is you know blackened out 
And therefore, medicine is not like any other profession, and you know it. It's not like being a lawyer, it's not like being a carpenter, it's not like being an engineer. It's dealing with human being, and it's dealing with human being at a turning point of their life, at a crisis point. And therefore, there are many issues that are related to medicine that are not scientific, that are humane, that belong to other era, to other arena, to the arena of ethics. How to deal with it? How to tell patients and how to tell families in a medical school, how to educate medical students to tell families that their beloved one is going to die? Can we learn it at all? What to do about it? So my talk today is going to be on ethics. But medical ethics is, a, is kind of my second or my third profession. I don't know what is my, you know, I moved from medicine. Now I'm in biology, but as a, another profession, I adopted ethics. I'm a member of many committees and so on and so forth. The dealing with these issues and the, the dealing with these issues is complicated because Indians are not Israelis. They have their own beliefs. They have their own tradition. They have their own history. The country is different in every country. You have to bring into consideration the beliefs of people, the history, the law, the, the music, the culture, the, the tradition of the family, and so on and so forth. So it's complicated. So I, you know, there is nothing like biomedical ethics. You need to, like in science, you have to focus and to be specific. So I'm going to talk about COVID-19 and ethics, not about the virus, not about the vaccination, not about the science, but about the bioethics. And even here I'm going to focus and to narrow it down to problems that we all faced. You faced it in India, we faced it in Israel, the American faced it in America. We are now just coming out of horrendous three years where we locked down, there were no flights, you know, people were infecting one another, millions died. The official count is 5 million, but the real count is 20 million. And I'm sure that India lost hundreds of thousands of people, my country tiny small country, we lost 14,000 people, one four thousand people, a country of eight and a half million people. So I'm going to focus on bioethics as related to COVID-19 and maybe we'll have time to go a little bit further and to expand it to medicine. So I picked up different issues and I'll go over one by one and these are all my ideas, they're all taken from the scientific literature Nothing is coming from, you know, from Wikipedia or from amateurish uh, type of literature. And I'm going to present you maybe problems that you didn't think about. So the first issue are treatment priorities. I remember when we had the first wave in Israel. And Israel has a very sophisticated medical system. And the amount of people that needed respiration came up. The issue was how to decide who will get on the respirator and who will not get on the respirator. So because we are very technologically oriented, people started to manufacture, you know, all people with patents, you know, artificial respirators like AMBO machines that work like automatically. No, this doesn't work. You know, respiration, artificial respiration is a profession. You need an intensive care unit. You need a professional team that will monitor all the physiological parameters. You need physicians that understand lung physiology and heart physiology. And, and vascular physiology and so on, it doesn't work like that. And very quickly we learned that everything must be done within a hospital, professional hospital context. And we wanted to know how we decide the number of teams and the number of machines is limited because we are not expecting a mass of people to come in. You know, on regular days and even during war days, we have, you know, that many people and we are ready for that. But the you know, that million people will become sick and 100,000 or 50,000 will need respirators, we are not ready for it. So how we decide? This is a moral issue because it's a decision on life and death. You say, no, you don't, cannot have it because you're old, because you are alone and you don't have a family, because you are sick, because you are stupid, because you are whatever. How can we decide that somebody will die and somebody will live? How can we decide about the life of people? So we appointed a committee that made of religious people, that made of psychologists, of sociologists, of physicians, 
of legislators, of politicians, and they made a score, a very complicated score. They gave points to each one. Let's say that you have cancer, and you're going to die anyway, so you get less of a score. But not only that, so it's diseases, and, and, and age, and, um, and, and social economic factors, and beliefs, and some people want to die, and all kinds of things. We made a list of more than 100 parameters, and each one was given a score. And in order to get on the respirator, you need to be above the score. And if you're below the score, you know, again, even if you're below the score, then I have to decide for you, because I make the score. The score is man-made. It didn't come from God. People made the score. So you still send people to their death, even with the score. But you know, what can you do if the shit is that long? And if you pull it on the leg side, it's exposed on the head side. And if you pull it on the head side, it's exposed on the leg side. But you need to have some tools, because every country is limited. You know, there is so much that you can do, even here in India. I mean, you have a limited number of bed, limited number of anything, for any area of medicine. Luckily, we didn't get there. We were very close to it. And then something happened. After we put all the people on the respirators and COVID was almost over, we learned a lesson that the score was not necessary. It happened so that almost all the people above the age of 65, almost all of them, who went on the respirator didn't get off. They died. So there was an age cut. So for next time, as cruel as it might be heard, we might use the age line. I mean, out of hundreds of people that were 90, that were, sorry, 65 and above, 99% of them died. And we were able to save only the younger one. So here nature and medicine worked for us. But nevertheless, the question is still up in the air. Because even next time, will tell you, sorry, guy, you are too old. I am too old to get on a respirator. What can you do? It just shows you, you know, the game between morality and the facts of life and how you learn in science and so on and so forth. Okay, the next thing, again, moral issue, <coughs> is neglected subject. You know, I, I just want to go to the previous one to show you that in Italy, really, people passed through it. And in New York, people died like, like, like nothing. I remember the, the, the open cemeteries in Bronx. I, I lived in New York for years. New York, for me, was like the capital of the world, culturally, cul culinary, academically, every respect. People died in the streets because they didn't have place in the hospitals. They opened cemeteries and they threw their bodies in coffins like hell. And even in Italy, in North Italy, in Milan, it says, Italian doctors on coronavirus frontline face top calls on whom to save. It was all over the world. Spain, doesn't matter. Spain, Italy, United States, everywhere. People face the same very problem. And I'm sure that in India, too, you face the, this problem. The question is how you approach it. Next issue is neglected subject. In our hospital, which is a 1,200-bed hospital, exactly like yours, a comprehensive tertiary hospital, we emptied almost all the hospital. We sent all the patients out, cancer patients. We left only 100 beds for emergency, for gynecology, for deliveries, cesarean sections, for road accidents, for very emergency cases. Patient didn't get irradiation, people in cardiology didn't get catheterization, we postponed everything. We pushed aside everything. The whole hospital became COVID-19 hospital. We opened more beds. More than 1,000 beds were converted one day into COVID-19. And COVID-19 is a disease. It's a severe disease in some cases, worse than flu. But who told us that COVID-19 is more severe than cancer patients that need irradiation? Who determines priority? Who determines that patients with congestive heart failure shouldn't get the stent on the right time because he might die because the heart pump will not pump anymore? Who decides for a child that needs, that has leukemia and needs chemotherapy urgently? Who will decide? 
Why we postponed everything? Who was the decision making maker to scroll the hospital, to, to close the hospital? I can tell you who was it. It was the public panic. The public panicked. The disease was a stigma. People were afraid to approach one another. They went with masks, with this, with this, with that. You can, I can remember in the hospital, people were you know, protected by, uh, by gowns and by masks. We were afraid of the disease. And the panic made us stigmatizing the disease. And accordingly, people say, you know, we shall do everything in order to get this devil out of our home. And one way is, of course, to treat them in hospital. But the damage, there was a huge damage that was done to other patients. And we cannot assess it. There is no way to assess it. So for next time, we have to learn. You know, from time to time, we have to live with the disease. What can we do? And we have to, have a, to, have to pay a price so other people will not pay the price. So again, I brought you one cartoon. You know, people are looking at the television and they look at the news on COVID-19. But meanwhile, climate change is going to drown them. And climate change, nobody cares about climate change. People think that it will come in 200 years. Not, it's coming now. Think about Pakistan, your not so beloved neighbor that sits, sits on the north side of India. The temperature in Pakistan and Afghanistan in the summer got to 55 centigrade. Women, you know, abortions rate was increasing 12 fold. People couldn't deliver even, women could not deliver. This is climate change. It's already here, now. Think about California, the drought in California. No rain in California. Think about the tornadoes that are coming all over the place to Florida every season and, and, and destroy half of the state. It's everywhere. And we need to treat it urgently. But for two years, all the conferences, everything was postponed. Taking steps against COVID, against climate change was postponed. And not only that. Think about programs in Africa. You know, in Africa, there are many public health programs. You know, AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis. These are all handled by people like you here, you know, treating the Himalayan, the Himalayan villagers. They don't have any protection. It needs to come from the outside to help them immunize themselves, to treat open tuberculosis, to immunize against malaria, to give them nets, to protect them from the mosquitoes in the night. Everything was stopped. And at the same time, AIDS, malaria, this is coming from nature, from magazine Nature. AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis are surging. They are coming up again. Why? Because they are neglected. Think about how many people are going to die from these diseases. Because there were no flights. Teams were busy with COVID-19 people. Nobody cared about AIDS. Nobody cared about tuberculosis. Nobody cared about malaria. Think about hunger in South Africa. There were no flights, so food was not flown. People died of hunger. They didn't have food to eat. This is not a disease. This is a disease that should not exist anymore. Nevertheless, people died of, hungry, of hunger in South Africa. We call it the pandemic of hunger. Think about drugs. Every year, 10, 20 drugs for cancer are coming to the market that are better drugs than the previous one. The British the Institute of Cancer Research in Great Britain said that the pandemic will delay cancer advances by nearly 18 months, 18 months, delay in release of new drugs to the market. Can you imagine 18 months that a drug like proteasome inhibitor, lenalinomide, a new antibody, Herceptin or any drug is delayed by 18 months to come to the market? How many women and men will die? Can you imagine? And who is, has the power to decide about it? Why we made this decision? So think about all that. This was all behind. We didn't think about it because we were fighting COVID-19. But we didn't think of the storm that is running behind. Now let's go to the more sensitive issue, and that's vaccination. And I want to talk mostly about, I don't know how it was in India, about vaccination hesitancy, about refusal to get vaccine, vaccination. We have to understand it. Again, as I said, people are people, and we should respect them wherever they are. 
And if they resist to something or they believe in something, we should understand it. We shouldn't tell them, oh, you're an idiot. No, they are not idiots. They have their own view. And we should explain them why, you know, the pros and the cons and the balance. And then they should make a decision. But vaccination is a public health issue. Because if you are not vaccinated, you can get infected, and then you infect the entire environment. Or on the other hand, let's say that the mother decides not to vaccinate the kid. And the kid is going to a kindergarten, but all the other kids are vaccinated. He is protected, but he is protected by selfishness. He will not get infected because all the kids are vaccinated. So the mother can afford not to vaccinate him. But this is selfishness. This is a selfish behavior. You don't do it because in a society, and especially in public health, we are responsible to one another. Why we wear a mask? Not only not to get infected, but not to infect others. Public health is, a, is public. We are responsible for all for the community, in a way. So therefore, we must get vaccinated. If you don't want to get vaccinated, fine. Stay home. Don't go to the supermarket. Don't send your kids to the school. Don't go to the theater. Don't go, don't go anywhere. Isolate yourself. Lock down yourself. That's OK. We shall not drag you to get vaccinated. But if you want to get out, then you have public responsibility. And the question is whether we can impose by law public responsibility. In democracies, we cannot. We cannot drag people and inject them. There is no way we can do it in any democracy, not in Israel and not in India. But what we do need to do is to understand their motives. And in the United States, it was a big problem. Think about the, you know, the, the demonstrations in the United States. Trust in God, not in vaccine. OK, fine. They say, you have to kill me in the upper right side before you vaccinate me. You know, people are ready to die. Well, they are not ready to die. This is a planned global power grab. The messenger RNA vaccine, the vaccine, will kill millions more than COVID-19. So the vaccine will kill more people than the disease. People were protesting vehemently. In China, too, by the way, all the villagers, all the mountain people didn't get vaccinated. They refused. Now, we have to understand it in order to explain them why it's worthwhile. And we have to understand the reasons for the refusal, the hesitancy. One thing is, of course, education. You know, it's all about education. People said, oh, it's messenger RNA. It's a genetic material. It may change your genetic repertoire. People don't understand that messenger RNA will not go back. It go forward to proteins. It will not go back to DNA. And it will disintegrate in a few minutes. It's the most unstable material in the world. You know, we need, you know, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine had to be frozen at minus 80 in order to be transported. And they had to be sold only a few minutes before they, being, they were being used, uh, injected into people. So people were afraid that the, the genetic repertoire may change. That instead of their children be being uh, human beings, they will become, they will deliver cats or dogs or I don't know what. So this is one thing, education. But the other thing is more important. The other thing is a trust. You know, when a government of India or in Israel want to vaccinate all the population, people have to believe that the government is doing its best. In other words, they need to trust the government. It's a contract. It's not a written contract. You are not buying a house. But it's a contract of trust. If the people don't trust the government, they will do everything opposite to what the government will tell them to do. They will resist it, because they say they lied to me already. Why don't they lie? Why are they not lying now? And I think that a good example is the United States of America. And look at this. This is a poll that was taken in different sections of the American population before the vaccine came out. And the question was one question. Do you plan to get coronavirus vaccine when one is available? This was just before the vaccine came out. And look at the division. I will not go into all the groups. Look at the white people.
look at the white people. 56% say yes, they will take it. 27 say they are not sure, 16 say no. Look at the black people. Only 25 said yes. Half of them, less than half. 32 do not know, and 40%, two and a half more than the white, said no, we shall not take it. Half of the black people in America said, even if there will be a vaccine, I will not take it. Why? Because I don't trust the government. And there is a good reason for the black people in America not to trust the government based on years and years and years on centuries of discrimination. They were brought as slaves from Africa. They were slaves in America. They were discriminated all the way along until our very days. Of course, President Kennedy tried to change it. Many Democrat presidents tried to change it. You know, Robert Kennedy, his brother, went down. He was the Minister of Justice, the Secretary of Justice. He went down to Alabama to enforce busing. Uh, in, 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 black, uh, can, in black states, but it, it didn't help. The, the black people in America are still discriminated. And I want to bring you one case of heavy discrimination of the black people in America. Oh, sorry for that. Here. It's called the Tuskegee experiment. This is an experiment that was done on syphilis. Now, syphilis is a disease that is caused by a bacteria called Treponema pallidum, and it's an easy disease. It's a sexually transmitted disease. You get an ulcer on your genitalia. You can treat it with antibiotic or with some sulfa, and it goes away. But if you don't treat it, it goes through the nerves all the way to the brain. It migrates along the nerves, and people become dementic, and they become paral paralyzed, and you are losing yourself completely. You become completely paralyzed and dementic, and you deteriorate and die. And a group of American physicians decided that they want to see the natural course of the disease. They don't want to treat the patient. They will tell the patient something they will lie to them. They tell them that they have some bad blood disease. They will treat them, they will inject them with water. And they will follow the natural course of the disease. This is a betrayal of the medical oath. When I graduated medical school, I swore that I will treat every patient the most I can do for him, no money taken, doesn't matter the gender, woman, man, Indian, Japanese, Christian, Muslim, Jew, no discrimination, patient is a patient is a patient. This is the oath that we all take when we graduate a medical school. This is a betrayal of the oath. And you can see here a white doctor on the right side inject saline into the vein of a black person in Tuskegee. They took 400 males that had syphilis and did not treat them. They lied to them. And they followed their disease. 200 died. Basically, the physicians killed them. By not treating them, they killed them. And in the New York Times, you can see here, syphilis victims in US study went untreated for 40 years. 40 years. The disease is very long, it's chronic. 200 died and 200 deteriorated. And only in 1972, 40 years after the beginning, the experiment was stopped. Only in 1972, the experiment was stopped. Now, you don't have to go further than that to understand why the black people will never believe a white government in the United States, never ever. You need a trust. And this is the absolute opposite of a trust. So this is give you a little bit of a, of a taste of what's uh, going on. And then there is also all kinds of things that are happening in medicine. You know, there was a doctor by the name of Andrew Wakefield that said uh, that the triple immunization against measles, mumps, and rubella, the MMR, is causing autism. He was a pediatrician. He published the paper in The Lancet. And at the same day that the paper came out, mothers stopped immunizing their kids in England, and then it spread all over Europe. And it took about 10 years to realize that this was a hoax, that he made it out of his you know, imagination, criminal imagination. 
I wonder why the Lancet editor took it. But nevertheless, probably he was so creative that he invented the data so well that nobody suspected that it's all a hoax. And it took, and you see, he said, you know, waging war on the autistic child. The children become autistic. And he said they are autistic because you immunize them against other diseases. And it took billions of dollars to negate it. And many, many studies had to come out, real studies. And the real study says there is no link between vaccines and autism. Vaccine ingredients do not cause autism. They thought that maybe it's the ingredient, not the vaccine itself. But these are all studies that took billions of dollars in 10 years. And only after 10 years, and after 3,000 children died of measles, measles is a fatal disease in some cases, the whole thing stopped. Now, I always think to myself, kind of humoristically, that if I go in the street in India or in Israel, and I pull out my revolver and I shoot somebody, I will go for prison for life, or they will hang me. But if you kill 3,000 people, 3,000 kids, nobody cares. This guy is still walking free. You know, it depends on how many you kill. The more you kill, the less you are supposed to be penalized. Opposite of what justice is supposed to be. So, if it comes from the medical community, the people say, the doctor said it. It's not me. This is not fake news. It's the doctor said it. And we just discussed today, uh, with you I discussed a case that happened in Japan. We shall, I shall send you the material. I re-looked into it. About another vaccination, which is HPV, that mothers are supposed to vaccinate the, the daughters against the human papilloma virus that causes uterine cervical carcinoma, but I will not go into it. Another hoax. So this is about ethics, right? This is all about ethics and why people don't get vaccinated against COVID-19, because they don't have the trust. And not having the trust is coming from these cases. Then there was another pandemic, which is called the infodemic. The social networks, Twitter, Facebook, completely irresponsible, completely irresponsible. I want to bring you one example, two examples. President Trump, who was the president at the time, became a physician all of a sudden. He <laughs> went to a university to get an MD degree. And he kicked out his wonderful advisor, Tony Fauci, and he himself gave advice to the people. You know, take hydroxychloroquine, take maybe Clorox, some, you know, some chlorine solution that you clean your toilets and inject it. You know, all kinds of nice ideas. Of course, people laughed at it and then he took it back. But it spread in the network, in the social networks, like, like a fire. I mean, you cannot stop it. And the same Madonna, even Madonna. She said that the whole the vaccine, they, there is already a vaccine. And Bill Gates has it, but he has it for the rich people, for his friends. And all the simple people will never get it. It's already there, but it's hidden. It's a conspiracy of the rich people to get rid of the poor one. Because the poor one don't make much. They don't pay taxes. They are relying on welfare. Why do we need poor people? Maybe let them die of COVID-19 by not vaccinating them. And only the rich people that can do it will survive. Nice, huh? So I think that here comes the issue of democracy. What can be said and what should not be said. People in the freedom, in the name of freedom of speech, say, I can say anything I want. You know, Twitter, Facebook, they are free. Just write down. Write down that the vaccine causes uh, uh, autism or the vaccine causes uh, uh, movement disorder, the HPV vaccine. Uh, write down whatever you like. Lie to the people. They will catch the lie very quickly. They, they, you know, people believe in the networks and so on. I think that this is the end of democracy. Democracy has a red line. And the red line is damage to the public. That's where democracy stops and discipline starts. You cannot say whatever you like because you are killing people with words. You know, words have more power than revolvers. Much more power. By one paper in Lancet, you can kill five or 4,000 kids. So we should be very careful about it. And we should be very careful to carry out stupid experiments that kill 
people that then, you know, the 200 people that died out of syphilis, very painful, but it's 200. But the million of people that died of COVID-19 because of this syphilis experiment, because they didn't trust the government, this is the real issue. This is the real issue. Therefore, we should be very careful. Democracy should be protected, but to an extent, until it comes to public damage. This is the issue. And let me end with the last one, and that's racism and discrimination. Whenever there is a, you know, I, I always uh, compare our culture as civilized people to the shell of an egg. You know, a shell of an egg is very thin and very fragile. It's very, you know, all our education that we eat nicely with, you know, with a fork and with a knife, and we have napkins and everything is nice, is thin like a shell of an egg. Basically, we are very wild people. If you take a kid in Africa, and from the very beginning, you tell him that, that life do not worth anything, you can give him a, a revolver at the age of two or three and he will kill people. He will kill people. So during stress, whenever there is stress, a pandemic, racism comes up. Discrimination comes up. So you see, you know, science has a racism. You know, even in science, we discriminate black people. White senior academics still resist recognizing racism. Even in science, we do it. And I remember very well one case, and that will be the last one for this talk, of the murder of the black person in Minnesota by a white policeman by the name of Chauvin. And he suffocated him, and the guy was calling from his mother for help. But nevertheless, he kept on pressing his carotid artery and his trachea until he died. That led, to, of course, to the birth of another movement, which is called Black, Matter, Black Life Matters. But it didn't change the discrimination. This was, I think, the ultimate in discrimination during the corona time that highlighted it. So whenever there is a stress, we break this shell of the egg, and we, became like, we become like predators, like animals. And we should be very careful about it. Culture is much more than something that should be broken in any crisis. We should be much more persevering, standing crisis, because this is our test. You know, it's, it's nice to live nice life and to drive our cars and to come to our homes and everything is nice and we have enough food and no diseases. But the real test is the test of crisis. And we did not stand this test, at least partially during the corona time. So I'll end up here. I wanted just to give you a little bit of view of what disease takes, not as fever, not as biochemical changes in the blood that you monitor in the, in the, in the laboratory, but what it takes on us as human beings. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. It's now time for question answers session. And for this, I'll request uh, Dr. Seni again to be on the stage to felicitate the session as moderator. Yes, ma'am. Uh, can somebody? Sir. Yeah, sir, get a this mic side. For her? Uh, yes, sir. sir, you have it. Okay. Ma'am, I'm afraid you'll have to wait for some time. Uh, good evening and thank you, sir. I'm Dr. Manjuketa Nath. I'm a pediatric intensivist here. It was a really wonderful and uh, is it too loud? Yeah, it was a very wonderful uh, talk. And especially being an intensivist, I think uh, we realize the human factors which play in, 
a very important role in the ultimate treatment uh, which we deliver. I just had a question that um, when you said about the decision makers taking decisions regarding what they need to implement, um, just with the example of COVID, there was a lot of discrepancies between the advice which were being given by epidemiologists on what uh, decisions and what principles need to be applied. Now, how uh, do you come across and how do you actually come over this disparity between the uh, decisions and the advices which is given by different sectors of epidemiologists and stuff? Yes, sir. So, how do as decision makers, how do you actually find? I didn't hear it because of the echo. He's telling the opinion coming forth from epidemiologists was different from those who were working in hospitals. So, do you have any comments about that? Well, epidemiology is a science, so you should believe it. I mean, it depends on the how professional are the epidemiologists. I think that the information should be identical, you know, from the hospitals and. You know, of course, the hospitals have a little bit of a biased view because in the hospital you see more the, the severe patients, while in the public you see all the range. So, you know, it might be a different, you know, conceptual view of what's going on. But I don't know whether I answered your question or... But, you know, epidemiology is very, very important because it has the ability to predict. You know, the epidemiologists told the Chinese <coughs> But once you open up, because nobody is vaccinated in China, because you locked down the whole country for three years, but you didn't vaccinate the people, you know, this, there will be a huge surge. And indeed, there was a huge surge. The Chinese didn't tell us the truth about how many died, but millions probably died once they opened up and, and the disease started to come up. So epidemiology is, for me, a science. I mean, not different than any other science. No, sir. Actually, my question was, there was disparity between the advices which were given by different epidemiologists. So as a decision maker, how do you decide, okay, I will... Not in Israel. In Israel, the advice that was given by the advisors was exactly what? predicting the situation. And the politician listened to them and we acted right. Okay. So it depends. <laughs> I don't know about India. <laughs> Well, I would like to share. You can ask questions about his discovery also, about his subject also, in addition to about COVID and biotechs. You, you can ask whatever right? you like. I whatever mean. you like. <coughs> yes, uh, you, know, you wanted to say something. Um, sir, I am a emergency physician. Oh. I would like to ask, like, we get a patient who is terminally ill. We can't do anything and we say just take away the patient and give home care. Are we ethically wrong or we should keep on doing till he uh, to, uh, totally succumb to his life? The question is what to tell the terminally ill? Yeah, usually we say you take home, you do care at home. We can't do anything. Ultimately, he's going to die maybe after six months or a year. Should we keep on doing something or the other or we should let it be? So are we ethically wrong in that saying? I think that it depends a lot on the family and the patient himself or herself. You know, some patients want to know all the truth. Some patients don't want to know anything. Some patients want you to lie to them. You know, and you have to sense what, you know, what is really. You know, you can always say, you know, if the patient doesn't want to, you can always say, we hope that it will be okay. Don't worry. If the patient you know, nowadays, patients don't need to ask you. They can go to Wikipedia. They can go to the internet. So in your country, they euthanasia is... They can go to wherever they want. And if you give them a, 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 a diagnosis, let's say a pancreatic cancer, they can go to Wikipedia and read pancreatic cancer. And they will learn from there that the survival rate of pancreatic cancer patients is only 3% for five years. So they have 97% chances of dying. And they describe it. The question is whether they will go to Wikipedia or not. Here Some people will say, I don't want to know anything. But, but so euthanasia in India is not... So uh, it, you have to do it. I think that you have to adapt your approach 
according to the background, the understanding of the patient, his will, you can sense it, the family, or the family will tell you how the patient is about accepting news, not accepting news, and so on and so forth. Because many you, patients, you they don't lie. want to yeah. You cannot tell to a pancreatic cancer patient that he will be cured. You should never lie. You can tell him, you know, we hope. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, sir. Uh, I'm Dr. Minu Gupta, head of radiation oncology at Cancer Research Institute, the team of Dr. Saini. And our pleasure, you are visiting from beautiful country and our pleasure uh, listening uh, from a Nobel laureate. So, sir, I just wanted to share my experience of COVID and your talk definitely for future working. Uh, at Swami Rama Himalayan University, definitely our country, the two faces of the same coin. S okay. So, so uh, sir, the strategy making for the scientists, that is very important strategy for the uh, next future. So, what you will advise if the COVID like surge is coming in the future, so uh, the strategy of the chess game like uh, uh, sending the soldiers initially and king has to stay back. Like a king, I didn't guard the COVID, but all my residents, all my staff guard the COVID, and we made the strategy. I was uh, standing behind to take over the uh, scene. And what is the strategy by the scientist for the upcoming years if such type of surge is there? So I didn't understand the question. This so was a co was comment or a question. I didn't under I didn't get it. No, I'm serious. I am very so serious. So, uh, if the countries had made future strategies, those people th uh, not having the COVID in the COVID surge, and those people are having. If there are the any planning, okay. I think that now, well, I don't know whether I answer your question, but nowadays, many countries, including India, decided that we are going to live with COVID. Okay. We are not going to fight it. We are going to vaccinate people. Like every year I get a, a shot for flu. So maybe every year I'll get a shot also um, for COVID. And every five years I get a shoot, shot against pneumonia. So we have to learn to live with it because the damage of fighting it is huge. Think about not flying. You know, think about all the airports were shut. Think about the huge damage to economy. Think what happened, the lockdown. Think about just the lockdown. I don't know if there was a lockdown in India. There was a lockdown. Think about old people that live alone and now they have to shut themselves away from the children, away from the grandchildren. Think about what it makes to them. Think about children that at the age of six have to go to school to learn how to read and write and they are locked at home for two years and then at the age of eight they go to school. Think about the two years delay, what it makes to your development. Think about the parents that had to go to work and to make money that have to stay with the kids at home. So, I mean, I think that the whole war against COVID-19 was awful in retrospect. It was awful. And for next time, we should just need to live with it, whatever it takes. Hopefully, we should be more ready. Hopefully, the new technology for making vaccines will catch up because it's very easy now. All what you have to do is to punch on the computer the sequence of nucleotide of the protein that code the protein and the machine will make the messenger RNA and you can go and inject it. So we already know that messenger RNA vaccines are working. So changing it, even, even in, in COVID-19, I got five, five shots. The last one was bivalent. I got both, both against the original one and against <laughs> BA15, the, uh, the, the very last one. You know, in order to switch from one vaccine to another, it's nothing. You just have to punch it on the computer and the different order of bases that make the messenger RNA will be synthesized. It's not a live vaccine, it's synthetic. Machine makes it. 
It's not like an attenuated virus like we used in, in polio or, or it's not a, a purified protein. It's a messenger RNA that you can synthesize in no time in your laboratory. So I think that for next time we should be more ready. But certainly I think that the panic that we all were living through was completely unjustified. And I pointed out about closure of hospitals, postponing of other subjects. Now I'm talking about the old people. Now I'm talking about the kids. I'm talking about the parents. Think what we did to ourselves just by not knowing this disease and by stigmatizing it. And uh, it's a disease. It's not as bad as a brain tumor. Thank you. I'm Professor Grish Gupta, head of neonatology in Himalayan Institute. It has been wonderful listening to you. I'll have two direct questions. One is to the topic which you have just discussed, and other would be pertaining to your primary research for the Nobel Prize. First, on the topic which we have just l heard from you, and that is ethical considerations. It's a huge topic. It is most important in everyday life of every clinician. But the poor part of this is that we don't train people how to take ethical decisions. We learn on job, which is at times perfect, at times it is less than perfect. I would like to know what you do in Israel in your medical education system about taking ethical decisions. Zero. <laughs> Unfortunately. You know, I am the only crazy on the faculty that tells them we have to do it. We have to do it. And then they say, no, we don't have time because we have to teach cardiology and pulmonology and immunology and nephrology and ear, nose, and throat and ophthalmology and oncology and orthopedic <laughs> surgery and everything and endocrinology. Everything they have time except for the most important one. And then I'll be happy. Uh, then I'll but be we are changing it. I, I'm very strong now. We are pushing it very strong. And uh, I hope it will change that at least we will not be able to teach because, as you said, it's huge. It covers everything. What I want the students to get out of school is with awareness that they know it's there. Yes. I don't want to teach them, but I want them to know that once they look at the eye of a family member, they will know that they look at a human eye. That's what I want them to get. We're very happy to learn this uh, right initiative in right direction maybe at opportune time. But I'll be very happy to share with you that in Himalayan Institute, in the Department of Neonatology, daily half an hour in the morning session is on this, where we do a case-based discussion and consider ethical decisions how to take. We give them some examples that suppose a death is to be declared, or ventilator to be switched off, what is to be done, how this decision should be taken, and what could be reaction. So I thought I will just share with you. That's on the first point. Now, second, I'm coming to your primary research, but my question will be applied question. We know large number of us suffer from cancers, degenerative diseases, genetic diseases, where possibly your research is making mark. But what I'm going to ask is that how nutrition and nutraceuticals can modify, prevent the protein degradation process and do a correct regulation of them. Hope I'm understood. Role of nutrition and nutraceuticals to put the protein degradation on course. Yeah. Uh, you know, if there is a genetic issue with the ubiquitin system, like a ubiquitin ligase, you know, there are, there are several genetic diseases that are linked to it, like Engelmann syndrome. I don't know if there are geneticists in the audience. Um, that of course, we cannot do anything about nutrition. It's genetic. The damage is done during pregnancy and uh, so on. Um, I cannot, you know, it's a very interesting question. I cannot think about it on the direct linkage um, between nutrition and protein degradation. You know, protein degradation is important. Um, but from time to time, it becomes excessive. If you take an orthopedic uh, patient, let's say that broke the, the hip or broke the pelvis, and you put it in the bed for two months, you know, like legs are like 
like this, or, or broke the spine, and you wait for fusion, you know, you lose kilograms of muscle mass, you know, by the ubiquity system. And you have to prevent it. You know, one way to prevent it is, of course, by, by artificial, very rich nutrition. That typically, you might not give peros, but you might give intraperitoneally or, or IV. Um, so this is one thing that I can, I can think of. But otherwise, in general terms, I cannot think, or maybe you can lead me. <laughs> yeah, give, I, give me an idea. I, I, I'll, I, I'll give you a little idea. You know. I'm a neonatologist, and my diseases pattern is neonatal jaundice, maybe um, s uh, diseases where some metabolism genes are involved. We are considering very seriously about antioxidants, use of curcumin, which is again modifying your protein degradation. So we are trying to bring in these components in a subtle manner. A time would come. In, in fact, there are NICU. We use uh, antioxidants to care of those, to take care of those diseases. So these are my suggestions. We are working on it. Yeah, but yeah, you no, know, I completely agree with you. I completely agree with you. Yes. But antioxidants, I, I, I was a little bit confusing. Is a food additive? It's not the food itself. You, you can argue that maybe vegetables. But you know, uh, vitamin E, tocopherol, yes. is a very good antioxidant. Yes. So if you ask me whether I believe in uh, oxidants, yes, I do believe yes. in oxidants. Yes. I myself take, yes. but I, I look at them more as food supplements than as nutritious food. In I nutritious food, I mean, you know, <laughs> polyunsaturated uh, fatty yes. acids, yes. Uh, things that are more, you know, less fat, yeah, yeah. less so cholesterol, so, sir, I mentioned nutraceuticals, which stated that I am giving some nutrition as pharmaceuticals, which includes omega-3. Thank you very much. In that, I believe you completely. Uh, sir, can I put it other way around? Uh, perhaps you wanted to know whether the basic status of an individual would, uh, would alter or influence the pace of the degradation of protein. Um, I cannot think of it. When you do physical activity, you know, people recommend me, my trainer, my personal trainer, tell me because you are doing so much physical activity, you should eat a lot of proteins. So the recommendation is two grams, you know, for people who are very active physically, the, the recommendation is about two grams per kilo per day. About, a little bit less, 1.6, 1.7 gram protein per kilo per day. That's in order to build yourself because you are wasting muscle by working out. But otherwise, I cannot think of it. I cannot think of a direct linkage. But antioxidants are very, it's a very good idea because they cause damage. They prevent damage to the protein and the oxidized proteins are degraded by the ubiquitin system. But then there will be other people that will tell you that hyperbaric oxygen is very good for the telomeres and it's anti-cancer. You know, in Israel, hyperbaric oxygenation become, became a big hobby. People are paying tens of thousands of dollars and every morning they are sitting, they are going into a pressure, high pressure chamber that put in <laughs> oxygen and they are built like airplanes. You have a television, you can enjoy yourself. There are newspapers and you are sitting for two hours under high oxygen pressure in order to elongate your telomeres, which will fight cancer and aging. So now we have to decide what we want. We want oxidants or antioxidants? <laughs> Maybe I'll just close my last remark. Uh, sir, you initiated me, sir. Thank you very much. You talked of hyperbaric oxygen. Uh, fortunately, I have experience in hyperbaric oxygen too. I've been fortunate to treat infections in newborn, deep-seated infections in newborn, osteomyelitis, and septic arth arthritis under hyperbaric oxygen. And we have a large set of patients here in India where we take patients to hyperbaric and use as antioxidants. So Indian experience is available.
Uh, yeah, uh, Professor, uh, is there a, a direct correlation between uh, the climate change and the occurrence of human diseases? Can we have an evidence-based study over it? Because there, we, can, we, we see a lot of you know, climate change and the occurrence of human diseases. But can it be correlated? I didn't. Yeah, but that's extreme in Pakistan. I mean, this is really extreme. Um, yeah, but in, in general, of course, the environment is very important, like, uh, you know, air pollution, humidity, and so on and so forth. But I believe that a lot, exposure to the sun, of course. In Israel, everybody wants to be an Indian. They want the dark skin. I don't know why, it's crazy. Everybody wants to be Indian. So they go in the sun. <laughs> they, in the summer, they go in the sun. But they don't protect themselves with an anti-UV irradiation. And you know, the rate of melanoma, of, can, of skin cancer, is huge in Israel. And this is a killing disease. This is not a joke, melanoma. It's a killing disease. Once you catch it a little bit late, you are dead because it metastasizes, and so on and so forth. So of course, exposure to the sun, nutrition, <coughs> All this, but people still believe now with the discovery of epigenetics that our repertoire is most detrimental. Initially, we thought it's genetics, but now there is epigenetics. You know, methylation, nitrosylation, and so on of the histone and gene expression that it carries a lot of our fate in it. And now people discover that even epigenetic is transgenerational. It go, it's inherited from generation to generation. Which people thought, no, it cannot be. Yes, it can be. So um, the environment is important, the food is important, but it's probably going to be mostly what we got from our father and mother. So I'm Dr. Heman Nautel, head department of general surgery. So my question is now department regarding of general surgery, sir. Surgeon, sir. So now lot of data is emerging regarding the coronavirus. So what is the latest information available that is the effect of ubiquitination on the coronavirus and the host cell regarding the management part and the prognosis? Yeah, in the we patient. know for sure that the ubiquitin system <coughs> processes the spike protein into peptides that are then presented to the immune system to generate antibodies. So in this case, the ubiquitin system is collaborating with the immune system in order to defeat the virus. So we know it. Yeah, enough data is available at not, so that this process can be used when predicting the prognosis and the management of the coronavirus. Data from the host cells, like the human cells. The post-translation modification it is causing there. I am not the sure that the ubiquitin system can help in predicting the prognosis of an individual patient. That has to do with some other genes, and mostly with during the disease, with genes that make cytokines. Because cytokine storm is the problem of problem, those who yes. die. And you can predict it ahead of time by biomarker, by taking IL-2 and, uh, and so on and so yeah. forth, and, and monitoring how they move up. And then you can predict whether the patient will run into a cytokine storm. Okay. So one, another question. So you were a trained surgeon. So what was the turning point that you became a biochemist and ventured into the field of research? Very hard question. <laughs> very hard question, but very interesting one. Okay, we can take uh, two more questions. Yeah. Uh, very good, good evening, evening sir. Uh, sir. Uh, I am Dr. Vandana okay, sir. and uh, I am very much starstruck right now in your presence and uh, I have a very simple question which I think most of us would like to know that how does it feel to receive a Nobel Prize and the second question is that what message can we give to our young uh, students or scientists who do have such aspirations. Thank you sir. What was the first question about Nobel Prize? How, how do you feel receiving the Nobel Prize? How do I feel uh, winning the Nobel Prize? Um, of course, I feel good. <laughs> I can tell you a joke. 
Rakesh would not have invited me here without the Nobel Prize. <laughs> so, so it gives you some advantages. But seriously, now let's be serious, there are two issues about it. One, that I try to use it for good purposes. So I'm volunteering a lot. I do a lot of education in Israel. I'm the president of the Israel Cancer Society. I'm the president of the Israel Melanoma Society. I'm president of the Israel ALS Society. So I put a lot of my time into the public. And then I use my, my leverage over the regular public to be kind of a spokesman for the needy and for the sick. You know, whenever there are problems, the government wants to cut, I always will show up in the television and, and tell them and so on. So I'm kind of an ambassador uh, in that sense. So this is, this is the advantages that the prize gives me. And then I learned that I was, I was relatively very young when I got the prize. I was 56 when I got the prize, which is very young for, for Nobel laureates. And the beginning was like I f was flying everywhere, you know, hoo-ha, hoo-ha. You know, it was like a big hype. And then I realized that it's useless, and I went back to the lab. And now I'm running my lab, we have people, we have grants, we have everything, and I travel much less than I travel uh, before because I want to do science. So that's what I want to do. So for me, the prize was, the beginning was nice, now all I do is education like I'm doing here. So because the whole idea is to educate and to converse with people. To learn the problem that they can learn our own. And then you come maybe second time and so on and so forth. So, um, so now I'm really focusing on education. I forgot completely about the prize. Unless I get an invitation and they say, oh, it's a Nobel Prize. We want to invite you. So this is the only thing that I remember. I don't don't wear a tie, I don't have any symbols, nothing. I want to do science and education. That's all. Right. One last, last question. Sir, please. Can I ask one? Uh, so my question would be direct. No, there are two. Okay, let's take two. Okay. You and okay. yeah, go Thank ahead. you so much, sir. Thank you. Uh, no, good go evening, ahead. sir. Uh, I'm Dr. Kiran from Department of Biochemistry. Yeah, we met. Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, actually, my question is direct. It's regarding your subject and your research. So, uh, since it's work, you have worked on ubiquitin, so I just wanted to know what is the uh, future for the drug which has been developed against uh, those ma misfolded proteins regarding uh, for the future of Alzheimer's and other misfolded protein diseases? Yeah, I think that the future is quite bright. There is no, I didn't talk about it, there are a new generation of drugs that are called molecular glues. They can bind to the protein on one hand, to the ubiquitin system on the other hand, and they bring them to the appropriate to the appropriate vicinity, so the ubiquitin system will jump on them. Without the glue, with the molecular glue, it will not, they will not come together. So and how people are already trying it in Huntington disease, where there are polycule expanded Huntington. They are trying it in, in several, in ALS cases, in several Alzheimer cases. So I think that, yes, the future is bright. Meanwhile, there is a, Another paper that came out uh, in Nature about a uh, few weeks ago about another antibody, Lena Kumab, I think, I don't remember the name, that, that, that binds to the aggregated protein and kind of dissolves them and then the ubiquitin system jump on it. So the idea is to dissolve the aggregate in order to make the substance more amenable for digestion by the ubiquitin system. So I think that yeah, I think that, I don't know when, but probably in the next maybe five to ten years, there will be drugs to fight neurodegenerative diseases coming from the bottom of the ubiquitin system. Thank you so much, sir. And small next question was, how are some proteins able to cheat the P53, uh, like, you know, uh, sorry, this ubiquitin proteasome uh, system? How are some misfolded proteins able to cheat it? and they are not being recognized by the system. What was the so how are some proteins, misfolded proteins, cheating on this system? 
that oh, they cheat on the system. Yes, they, th that ubiquitin is not able to pick it up. Yeah, this is very interesting. You know, the aggregate is like a mesh. So the protein find it very difficult to nibble in. It's like hard egg. Okay. So uh, we think that if we'll come with a molecular glue that has a bridge, then it will be much easier for the ubiquitin system to dig in because the ubiquitin system will be a little bit remote and there will be a bridge to the protein. So we think that that might overcome it. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. No, there was another one here from this gentleman. And that will be the last, I think, no? Sir, it's really a pleasure to listen to you. I am Dr. Sanjay Gupta. I am a faculty member in Himalayan School of Biosciences. In reference to your paper published in Proceeding of the National Academy of Sciences, 1998, where you have given a beautiful diagram where you have seen that how this protein moves and how it bounds to the E3 subunit of the lyca, that is, where the ubiquitin binds finally after activation and the protein binds to the E3 subunits. And after that, it is being transferred to the two different type of proteases, 26 proteases, 26S protease or proteasome, which is having a symmetric symmetry and one is an asymmetrical one. Sir, how it, was, how it was decided that which protein will go to the asymmetric one and which will go to the symmetric uh, proteasome subunits? Because one is 26, 19, 20S and 19 and another is 19, 20S and 28S. That's what I like to ask. Whether it's a, some signaling from the cell or it is a protein which how it decided to go to the asymmetric and symmetric one proteasome subunits. Maybe I... You know, this is a very particular technological question about the ubiquitin system that I don't want to, you know, to bother all the audience with it. Uh, so maybe we can talk. I think academics very particular because I'm teaching this, your topic, it is being covered in our molecular cell biology program. So I like to teach the student that final integracies which you have mentioned over there in the particular diagram. That's I why I answer it very briefly. We don't know yeah. because we don't still have a structure of the proteasome. Yeah with a substrate. Yeah. We need to have a 3D dimensional structure in order to understand this. So we don't know, basically. We have piece and bits and pieces, but we don't have the picture. One thing I wanted to ask you further, that what, uh, the, uh, the accumulation of these uh, misfolded proteins and all these things, whatever, the, which are not being degraded pro properly, they accumulate into the system and cause a lot of diseases. Sir, as a scientist and as a uh, still learning a lot of things in the uh, s biology, sir, can we do this type of research over here in, a, in, our, in, in our university in association with the neuroscience people and other people who are, because this particular is, is going to have a impact onto the most of neurodegenerative diseases. So can we have this type of work? Can we do this type of work in our university? So anything can we get you the data do, when we, where the others are, we can have a linkages with other units, some okay. other universities also. This has to do with, um, with sir, building an academic ecosystem. Sir, can you help us in this, uh, doing this type of research over here in our university? I can tell you what we do. I can invite you to in our place to see what we are doing. Yeah. And I think that any medical school and any university should have a very strong basic research base. I don't think that you can teach medicine or do anything without a very strong research base. Rakesh is here. He was educated in the United States. There are many people here that came from the United States. You know well the American system that, uh, you know, you go to a PhD, a real PhD, and then a postdoc in a good institute. Then you bring people back. I said yesterday that I was g offered positions in the United States. But I decided to go back to my country in order to do research there because I will be much more impactful. What it requires, it requires an ecosystem that the president or the chancellor of the university will decide that they are going for recruiting good people, initially few, just to see how it works. In whatever we decide about priority, let's say that we decide to build the department of neuroscience or department of metabolic diseases, diabetes, doesn't matter. And then you go and advertise that you are looking for people, let's say two, three stars, superstars, but when they come here, you need to give them startup funds, like in the United States. 
you need to give them a lot of money. The question is whether you have the money. Rakesh will tell you that in America and in Israel, when we start a young faculty, we give them between half a million to a million, not rupees, US dollars. So if you have the money or you can ask uh, rich people around here and I can talk to them, I'm ready to come back and help you, but it need to be prepared. I mean, I don't want to come. Well, I come to through the area and having good food, but if you prepare it, I'm ready to come back one time and like Rakesh established the distinguished professorship, you know, we can go deeper than that because the, you know, think about it. It's a very good question that you ask and therefore I take the time to answer you. You know, the distinguished professorship is a very short term. It's two days. You come, you go. Okay? And whatever you remember, you remember and you take home. But basically at the end of the day, not much is left after it. You know, students will remember me, maybe they remember that I was a good speaker, maybe that I was a bad speaker, doesn't matter. They remember something, that some Nobel Prize from Israel was here and talked to them, and maybe f after three years they will even forget that. But I think that one lesson to learn from this one is not only, is not only to bring the Nobel laureates or whoever to give a talk, but maybe either to come back or to stay for a week and to sit with the people and to try to build a program, an ecosystem, to really make this university moving forward. I think that this will be the case. Thank the you, issue. sir. Thank you. And if this lesson will be learned, I'm volunteering to be the first one to jump in back and to come maybe for a week to sit with you to see what you have. If you are bringing a donor or somebody a company in India, I'm ready to talk to them, maybe a pharma company to tell them, why won't you give us support bringing in, sorry, why won't you support bringing in one or two prominent scientists that are trained in the United States and build their labs and let them build the hub of high quality here in the university. So either, you know, either a donation or a company or an insurance company or pharmaceutical company or I don't know what. But if you prepare the background, I'm ready to come back and try to nail it down. And this will be, this will be the benefit of this lecture. Because otherwise, you know, words are vapors. They go away. They never come back. Remember. But Thank deeds, you, sir. what you do, stay with you. Thank you, sir. that we come to the end of uh, Dr. Ron's session. I'll now invite uh, Pro Vice Chancellor Dr. Vijendra Chauhanji to present the vote of thanks. Honorable Nobel Laureate Professor Aaron, distinguished dignitaries, faculty members, and my dear students. I pray to the divinity within you all. Friends, we all are privileged that this temple of education, compassion, and love has been blessed today by Professor Aaron, a Nobel laureate from Faculty of Medicine from Israel. Sir, on behalf of Swami Rama Himalayan University family, I extend our sincere thanks to you for sparing your available time out of your hectic schedule and accepting to deliver the prestigious inaugural lecture of Distinguished Lecture Series of Swami Rama Himalayan University. Your scientific temperament and inspirational thoughts have touched the deepest corners of the hearts of our students, research scholars, and faculty today, and they would go a long way in shaping their lives and fulfilling their dreams in future. Sir, by your gracious presence, you have touched all of us today. I'd like to thank our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. Vijay Dasmana, who is carrying forward the legacy of love, serve, and remember of His Holiness Swami Rama in its true spirit. I'd like to thank all the Honorable Members of the Board of Governors, Board of Management, and Academic Council of Swami Rama Himalayan University for providing continuous valuable guidance to the university from time to time and gracing the occasion today. I'm thankful to all the government officials, 
vice chancellors, deans of various academic institutions of Uttarakhand for gracing this occasion. I'd also like to put on record the sincere and dedicated efforts of our advisors, directors, registrar, principals of all the constituent academic units, heads of various departments and faculty members for gracing the occasion. From the core of my heart, I thank all of them. I'm also thankful, thankful to all the members of the media and press for covering this great event. Friends, His Holiness Swami Rama was a wave of bliss. Though he's not in his physical form today, we all can feel his fragrance and presence at the campus. This place is his karma bhumi, a place where he served humanity. We all are privileged to be a part of this great vision. Let me share you the last words of His Holiness Swami Rama. He said, all I have is a gift of love which I received from my master and other sages. The same gift I offer to you all. May you receive, retain, and multiply it in your hearts. God bless you all. Thank you very much.